Wow, Zoom just told me this meeting is being recorded. Did anybody talk about this? Dan Sapin. I am a Long Island based psychologist and want to be a musician. And uh, I'm here with my buddy Martin Hallberg, calling in from Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, I am a poet, want to be a psychoanalyst, and in general, a guy who likes theories and deep, profound questions and try to make sure my mind don't become too rational and technical at points. And we also have with us. Uh, Joe Messina, I am uh, the sound guy producer um, who may chime in from time to time to ask a question or continue on track, and uh, I'm calling from Boston. All right, that's right. You moved, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> cool. So what are we doing here and why? Uh, Martin, you want me to take a stab at this, or you want to tell the story of how we came to be? Well, I think if you're fine with it, maybe I can go because I think um, this first kind of episode, we have decided we want to call it, if you can be you, maybe I can be me. So that's a quote that has a kind of profound meaning in a way for, for the reason that came about that me and Dan started to chat and later on Joe came in. Um, and it's actually based from, from a line of books and authors and, and various uh, interplays between texts. So maybe I should tell that anecdote and then you can kind of chip in after after I've told a little story of, of how we yeah. two actually met Dan. Yeah, yeah, I like the way you tell the story. Yeah? All right. Go for cool. it. Yeah. So this was maybe in 2017, I think. I, I came across a, a psychoanalyst it's called Mike Egan. Um, he's in New York as well, right? Is yeah. He? Yeah. So Michael Egan. And I have the book here. It's called uh, Faith. So this is uh, one of Mike's many books he's written almost 20 books i think and in this he he tells a story of what it meant to him when he was a young therapist in the making trying to find his path in life uh, he was inspired by in turn an older therapist called beyond wilfred beyond it's a british it was a british guy and he has this story of when mike egan came to a party and saw wilfred beyond at that party um, and I think I want to recite, it's, it's not a long passage at all, it's, it's in this book, Faith, and it made kind of a profound impact on me when I read this. So here goes Egan, and I quote them, I would like to mention a few odds and ends relating to Beyond's visit to New York in 1977. At the party, I was one of those who stood around him as he recited passages from Milton's Paradise Lost. My own father used to write Milton's L'Allegro and Il Impensoro and tell me what they meant. Both Bion and my father appreciated poetry. Heine was my father's favorite poet. You might find it quite odd to see a renowned 80-something psychoanalyst at a party reciting Milton's Paradise Lost. All kinds of thoughts raced through my head. Does this man have a difficulty relating? Is he autistic? Is he schizoid? Yet the fuller message was, he was being himself, his idiosyncratic self. A message came through to me. If he could be beyond, I could be me. Seeing beyond recite Milton at a New York social gathering made me feel freer to be me. So there was something in this passage that really struck a chord with me when I read it some four or five years ago about the importance of, of being able to be who one is with all the complexities and idiosyncrasies that that entails. So about a year later, I came across this book called Freud's Lost Chord. It was from a New York-based psychologist, psychoanalyst, and I was intrigued because it dealt with the interplay between music and affect and language. And that was my kind of summary of it. So I ordered this book and I read it and I really dug it. I found that same kind of genuine voice speaking through to me in some way, you know, that same kind of feeling of, Whatever it is that this guy is doing, there is something there that inspires me. There's a certain spark. There's a certain hope, I guess, that ignites in me. So I wrote uh, to Mr. Sapin, the author of this book on LinkedIn, and I just said, you know, man, I really appreciated your book. It was important to me on different levels, you know, partly because of where I was in my life at that time, but also because of the ideas that it conveyed. 
And to my surprise, I got a quite uh, energetic message back within like two hours, like, hey, thanks for, for, the, for the props, you know, I really appreciate your feedback. And if you're up for it, let's talk someday. So it so came to be that me and Dan started talking, having these Zoom meetings once a week for about a year now, like we've gone through the whole pandemic, I, I guess, more or less. Um, having about two hour sessions every Sunday where we just talk about life or our different problems, our different uh, gains and joys in life. Uh, and we kind of sway between a different array of subjects, psychoanalysis, boxing, arts, poetry, music. Um, so at that point, that kind of phrase came back to me like, I read that book of Egan. I was inspired by the quote. I wrote to a guy who had written another book I liked. I got a response. And in fact, some of these meetings have been a way for me to feel freer and fuller to be myself. So I think this is a kind of a theme that we would like to kind of unpack today. What, what could this be about? The, the fact that somebody is being him or herself can make a difference for another person. Uh, so that's also that's an individualistic theme in a way, but it could also be seen as a structure or, or communal or yeah, we can go different directions with that. So it's Absolutely. maybe a long, a long way, but that's that's I think my my intro to to who we are in this setting. Um, no, I think that's perfect. Um, in a way, the way we're talking about this today reflects uh, <clears throat> an awful lot about how the show this show came to be why we're talking about this to begin with because Martin had this experience of reading Michael Eigen uh, and at about the same time in my life same age as Martin was when he was reading Michael Eigen and then found my book uh, Freud's Lost Chord um, I also trying to find my direction in graduate school thinking I've got to be a psychologist but uh, I have absolutely no idea how I'm going to write these ideas in my head uh, and, and make it work. I came across Michael Eigen's book at the time, The Psychoanalytic Mystic, uh, was the one that sort of turned, turned me around the corner uh, in a better direction. And I also came upon another quote that was very similar, because Eigen refers to this as one of his main stories. This is, this is like a, a formative moment in his life. Eigen, who, you know, I try to see him every few years, he's a very inspiring man. Um, he's in his mid, mid to late 80s now. Uh, and at about the same time in his life, he had that encounter with Wilfred Bion. And then I had that encounter with Michael Eigen. And then Martin had that encounter with Michael Eigen and with me. And each of us, in turn, had the experience of finding someone else whose individual voice gave us the inspiration to pursue our own voice and not just to find the voice but even to have in a way the courage to have an example to follow that it's possible to do this that if you have unusual ideas or ideas that aren't quite formed yet but you know they're going somewhere and that maybe you can build a life around this mm. then if this guy did it so can i and in doing our having our talks every every Sunday afternoon, which has just become this 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 wonderful nourishing part of my, my life, we've come on upon so many ideas. Um, one of them being in this exact way, how can people uh, set an example through their own life that makes it possible for another person to make their life? And 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 Martin, uh, you came up with the example of a, of lighting a candle, I think. Or lighting a, a fire, uh, and that you have people, you know, in, in kind of a metaphorical uh, wilderness. Uh, someone lights a fire just so they can see and have heat and and survive. But there's somebody that that first person doesn't know exists yet, who sees that fire being lit and realizes he's not alone, and then he lights a fire, and in turn, you know, lights start going on all around us, and not only do each of these people now have heat and light and a way of pursuing their life but now they know they're part of a community and in the process of creating a community they discover themselves as individuals yeah. and this there is was some an interplay there. yeah th this this was an experience it wasn't an in i mean martin and i go as deep as we can philosophically but this was a gut feeling of, wow we can do this you know may maybe i can make something out of my life now that that you know with this as sort of a, a spine to it to hold it together yeah. um, 
So, so maybe... yeah, I, I was going to ask a question, but I saw Joe nod. Maybe he had a question. I think Joe's questions are probably more on point than mine. I don't know, Joe, do you want to come in? Um, yeah, not a question so much as, um, you know, I think when we first sat down, uh, the three of us, we talked a lot about comedy um, and, you know, stand up is is the way that I can relate to what you're saying here the most. Um, and I think, uh, you know, through stand up and, and comedy podcasts, uh, we see a lot of that now um, over the past decade or so. It's a way that people build a community. It's a way that um, people uh, talk about their own experiences in a way that can uh, speak to what other people are dealing with. Um, and yeah, I think that's, it's a worthy uh, goal and maybe the, maybe the most important goal of, of any kind of art or communication. Yeah. Yeah. It. And I mean, when you told me, Joe, about your background in stand up and stuff, I mean, for me, it's really like, and I fully mean that it's like the most courageous thing I can think of. Like, I can't think of a more kind of exposing environment than to be the furthest out on the, I don't know the word now, my sweet, the planche, you know, like we used to have these old books with, with the pirates and stuff. And they put the guy out on one plank. A plank is the English word, right? Mm -hmm. So you have one to go to plank. the plank. Yeah. I think of stand up as that. And I think I would like to relate that to some threads I see here. Like if we stay on, like, what is it? Like, what are we actually talking about? These lighting of fires. I mean, there's something about confirming one's own individuality. And I guess stand up is a perfect example of that. Like you're never more alone in a sense. But what Beyond did at the party is similar. Like the guy is standing reciting poetry, like he's an autistic in his own head. Uh, so there's some kind of bravery and courage involved. But then there's also that other aspect of like, being yourself fully allows you to enter community. So there's like an interplay between individuality and community. And then there is something about bravery or courage. Like, I don't know, I'm trying to find a few nods. Like, what are we actually framing here? Like, there is something there, right? Well, look at look at the things that we have used, uh, you know, that, that, that we've brought into this discussion. Uh, each each of them sort of being being another fire lit another piece of illumination um freud's lost chord which was you know was my attempt to get get a phd and also say what i'd been thinking about my field and its ideas all these years uh i use jazz uh i love jazz and i as an as a musician i'm an improviser i can't help but improvise you know there's a thing about uh saying it in jazz you never play the same thing once no um, and uh, so it's always variation, but in there, among the things we've talked about were jazz, which we were able to compare to what happens in psychoanalysis or psychotherapy, which is not just talking about your problems or getting things off your chest. It's about seeing what happens when two people, especially the, yeah. the patient, but in much of today's psychoanalytic work, the analyst is very much of a person too, not just this old, what well, used to be referred to as a blank screen, uh, that it, it's how personalities play off each other. It's like a, um, Beyond, and I, I don't recall if he was quoting somebody, maybe T.S. Eliot, uh, said that when two personalities meet, there is an emotional storm. Yeah, that you can imagine that is these, beyond, two, yeah. these two weather fronts coming together and creating something, something big. Uh, and it, so in, in jazz, you have musicians coming together and sharing their musical ideas, which are, are fueled by their emotion and their imagination and the way they think, but not in words. Uh, my idea was that music is an example of how so much of what we do in our minds and our hearts and spiritual spiritual things uh, are not about language and, and making rational sense, but something even bigger, you might say. Uh, and that's what happens in music. It's personalities coming together and, and, and making something new happen. I'm also, I've always been a boxer. I've always had this fascination with the sport and I fought when I was younger and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pu pushing social security age and I'm still doing it. And now Martin has been boxing. And so, of course, since we, you know, everything is grist for the mill here and food for thought, um, 
Now we have two people who, yeah, are punching each other in the ring, but it's more than that. We're working not just on skill uh, and on getting our hostility out and getting in shape, but um, it, when we're in there sparring with each other, which you know Martin and I both did like less than an hour ago, I think, or you know, yeah, yeah, this morning over here, yeah, yeah, and I put in a bunch of rounds too. Uh, it, we're also dealing with our courage, just like walking that plank or getting out mm -hmm. on stage. Um, you talk about being in the moment in which you know mm -hmm. the wrong word, the wrong move, uh, you know, one moment of bad judgment or lapse in concentration means something bad happens. Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, you you handle this and you deal with the pain or the humiliation, the frustration, these momentary successes. Um, yeah. You discover things about yourself, and in the boxing ring, like in jazz. Like in analysis, everybody comes out of it a little bit changed. Everybody comes out of it knowing something they didn't know before. Um, but this emotional storm that you mentioned, it's funny because since I have this book here, the Faith Book, there is a funny synchronicity going on because your publisher then was Meg Harris, right? Mm -hmm. Meg Harris Williams. So she's a woman who's the daughter of another British God psychoanalyst uh, yeah. called uh, Donald Meltzer. Yeah. And she has this publishing firm, and she's actually on the backside of the faith book by Egan. And what she writes is that um, Egan's idea of faith is not one of transcendence, but is rather deeply rooted in feeling another's presence on the pulses. And he never loses touch with his sense of wonder at the unfolding of the therapeutic relationship with its telling power to help people experience their experience and not rush past it. Uh, this sustains the turbulent test of how two humans can learn to survive one another. So it's funny because it's exactly what you're talking about, this emotional storm and how to be able to survive that encounter. And of course, it could be with more than two people. It can be in a triad or in a group or in a social tribe or whatever. But there is that quality of being able to, if I walk the plank, I will be able to learn something that will help me survive the encounter with other people. Um, and I don't know, Joe, if you've had the, if you have examples of that, of like how doing stand up has helped you kind of survive other relationships or, or encounters with like buddies or family or, you know, average Joe on the street or whatever, but that, that builds a certain kind of uh, capacity to tolerate presence to kind of be in what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know if stand up ever benefits my life. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, no, I think more than anything, it made me less afraid to, to just, just say the thing or do the thing. Um, and you know, again, like that doesn't always produce a, a super positive result, but like, yeah, if I'm, if I'm dealing with, um, with any kind of uh, uncertainty or, or uh, a, an issue with someone I work with or a family member or whatever, uh, it's uh, made it much easier for me to to just say whatever it is. Uh, yeah. That's such a good analogy, I think, to like psychoanalysis, right? It's like people, including myself, you wait, you wait years to actually say the thing and to even figure out what is the thing to be said, you know, like it, it could be like a miraculous release of just like something that has been difficult to articulate or, or get your hands on. And when it pops out, it's like, whoa, and you, a new door open, like you break through some predictive coding schemes in your brain and you reach that kind of gamma state, you know, where Buddhists live, like, boom. I'm in a fucking open field now. Like, yeah, you know, and I guess boxing has the same quality. I'm too bad at it. I haven't really got there yet. But well, maybe I mean, you probably will at, at some oh. point. But look, look at how everything is tying together here. I think uh, I don't have the book Faith handy, uh, but um, well, take a look at the back of that. Did she say at the mm -hmm. end the two people surviving each other? Yeah, at the, at the back. At the back, it says that. Uh, Faith, because the book is entitled Faith, right? And in the, I mean, this is not a divinity, deity. Um, this is what, what Eigen calls psychoanalytic faith, right? So there is an important point to be made. But he sees this faith as the heart of the psychoanalytic encounter. Uh, 
And then she writes, deeper than belief system, faith sustains the turbulent test of how two humans can learn to survive one another. To survive one another. Yeah. Uh, everything we're talking about here uh, re relates to the even finally saying the thing that you need yeah. to say that maybe you've been afraid to say or even afraid to acknowledge that you need to say. Just yeah. learning that you survive it. That in yeah. fact you have survived everything that has ever happened to you. Yeah. Even the yeah. most humiliating things, well here you are. Yeah. Um, that is liberating um, in so many ways. It happens in the ring. Uh, yeah. You know, I sparred two people today, uh, you know, and I, I'm going into boxing after I've come back to the sport um, after some surgery, which has left uh, me with a partly numb leg. And it, it means a lot of the things I've learned how to do over the years don't work all that well. And here I am, I'm, I'm fighting a, a young woman, is a women's boxing. Our gym is a big, a, a, has been a big part of female boxing, which she's turning professional, she's excellent. And then a young guy, a college wrestler who's been fighting for a couple of years and he's 22 years old and you know, he's a 57 year old man with a lot of aftermarket parts. And, um, you know, and our, our trainer, who's like a, you know, our elderly Manny Pacquiao, you know, uh, who's just all gung-ho about this sport, uh, and he's asked me, you want to go another round, Danny? You want to go another round? And in my head, I'm saying, I don't want to die. You know, I, I, I don't know how to defend myself. I have a numb foot. I'm old. And I said, nah. I, I've done this thousands and thousands of times. The worst that ever happened is I got a headache or a bloody nose and I felt bad about myself for a couple of minutes. But most of all, I've learned that the very worst moments I have ever had in a boxing ring or in life um, really only stressed me out, then taught me something and then spit me back out into my life and say, here, try this now. Yeah. Uh, so we survive each other. We survive our own fear. We survive yeah. the pain, and I'm not saying that it's all just fine and dandy, you know, it's like from Candide, Dr. Pangloss, everything is for the best in the best of all possible worlds. That's a bunch of, you know, nonsense crap, but the fact is, <laughs> here you are. There was uh, Winnicott, uh, D.W. Winnicott, who was, uh, you know, in the same uh, lineage in a way as, as Bion, who had said two things, that, that artists uh, exist on a knife edge. Uh, I, I'll find the rest of the quote, but uh, and they're always dealing with 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 the stuff in us that puts us on the brink of collapse. That we make art of some kind, even the art of ideas, you know, the the art of, of boxing. Um, that because we're taking something that is dangerous, something primitive in us that could destroy us if we don't know what to do with it, and and we make something out of it. Sometimes what we make out of it is the fact that we can survive it. Um, and uh, Winnicott had also said something like, and again, I'll find the, the quote one day, um, that the catastrophe you fear the most is an echo of the one you've already survived. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's Winnicott. The, the break, the catastrophe has already happened. Yep. And then and it, I, can, I can testify to that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But I mean, I, th there is definitely something in what you're saying that vibes with this <laughs> beyond an Egan style of always saying we're too much for ourselves. Like we individuals don't know how to deal with our own input and sensory data and thoughts. It's like an overload and we don't know how to process it and metabolize it and digest it, right? So you have acting outs, you have like rashes more or less, right? That you need to, because you, you don't have the capacity to sustain all of that information. And, and that kind of metabolic process is alchemical in some way and i think community whether it's in stand-up boxing psychotherapy poetry that jazz. i deal with yeah jazz exactly like that sustains the, that builds those walls that allows a certain capacity to be built like you can spit out you can use objects that's also winnicott use your fucking parents use your family use them in the sense that they build you stronger right so when you're really terrified of an object, whether it's your parents or your siblings or your partner or your teacher or your coach or whatever, you can't use them, right? Because you're so scared of what your own destructivity might entail. You don't dare to punch the guy you're sparring with, right? You go to sparring, but you're too afraid to hit him. So use the object would be analogous to like hit the guy so you get the feeling and the experience of what it feels like to hitting someone. 
uh, and then you can learn from that. So I think community is a key part in that in some way. Yeah, um, and you use the word object. I just want to clarify um, something uh, that, that in uh, our psychoanalytic language, uh, object more or less refers to sort of the mental, the internal reflection mm -hmm. of of a person or of people. It's somebody that, uh, there's your real mother, and then mm -hmm. there is the image and that, that sort of package of emotions and, and routines and memories that represent mother, the way she lives in your head. Uh, mm -hmm. And that a community, uh, we call object relations, is the field of, of, of psychoanalytic uh, theory and practice that came uh, after Sigmund Freud, uh, that is really about the object relations, the relationship inside ourselves, uh, mm -hmm. what is the kind of the mental map, uh, or rather the mental pinball machine, uh, or mental Tetris, use your, pick your analogy of how all of these traces of people from our experience, how they all bounce around and, and create something in, in your head, a whole mm -hmm. bunch of storms. You know, this right. internal storm that, that comes from all of our own ideas and feelings and memories banging into each other and then crashing into the stuff. You know, you try to go to 7-Eleven without, with, without having a strange thought about a stranger coming down the street. You know, is, is, is he scary? Does he, look, does he look like my cousin or the kid who beat me up in second grade? You know, these little passing thoughts that you have. And I think any one of us can pick a moment in our lives in which we kind of live out all of the expectations of how people are going to relate. What, what do I expect when I walk into a crowded room of strangers? You know, who in here do I have to worry about? Who in here am I attracted to? Who in here, you know, would I like to know more about? Uh, who's going to destroy me? Um, we all have yeah. some version of that. And those are the, the objects in our heads, uh, all kind of um, forcing us to deal with our, our, our fears and our, and our desires. And, um, and they shift, right? They, 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 they transfigure, they transform throughout life. That's the, that's the tricky part and the golden nugget also, right? That, that's, that's the case for therapeutic work also in a way, right? You can change your internal images of certain situations and people by getting to know yourself deeper and attacking the same problem from, from many angles. But I guess to just kind of wrap up this uh, little segment of it or whatever, may, is, is the idea we're talking about maybe that all these internal objects in one's head, when they become individualized, idiosyncratic and respected in their worth, they become small fires, right? So they, they go from being scary or, or, or um, uh, what is that word, persecutory, to rather becoming warm <laughs> beams of fire within an individual, right? So there's been some kind of maturity where you feel uh, safe to, to play and be yourself and, yeah, and express I love that, that, that image that, mm. that uh, these, if you think of the, all of those forces in us, the, the, those emotions we don't know how to handle or the things we fear as being fires that we, we feel are, are being set within us or a fire that is within us that is going to consume us after a little bit of experience and survival, you know, to live, the word survival means living after, uh, the afterlife, um, in a funny way, that each of those fires become something that is illuminating or something that mm. warms you or something that, that facilitates, you used the word alchemical before, yeah. the alchemy here, which is to, to take the rough stuff and let it transform into something good, something nourishing, something transcendent that takes you to a better place in your life. Uh, so those fires can burn you up. You know, we've mm. all had the experience of, be, of feeling like we're going to be destroyed by our own emotions and our own thoughts and our own weaknesses. And you survive enough and you, in along the way you create some things and you love some people and some people love you and you have some some crashes that you manage to walk away from and some people who have given up on you and you, you there you still are you know and, and each of those fires has become something that has created a new part of yourself yes uh, Something oh, that, and I mean, yeah. it's, it's fantastic what, a, what in this case, in this anecdotal line, what a book can do. Or, you know, like a little can go a long way in life, man. And that's also an Egan quote that I love. Like a small thing, like, for example, writing, reading a book, shooting it off an email to you. Like that has been part of a process of producing some of this alchemical 
change in a way where I'm, I'm, you know, at a lot better state than what I was four years ago when I read these books. So like, it's an important point to me really that a little can go a long way in life. Like one call, one individual, one book, one song, one, one little thing that hits different than the other ones have done can, can be that little starting part of a journey that leads you eventually yeah. to a new, new field. Right. Absolutely. But Joe, where are we heading? Are we making any sense or are we, uh, yeah, straight I think, off yeah, I think so. I just, I had a question in the, if, you might have sort of touched on this in that last stretch, but um, a couple of minutes ago was the the catastrophe you fear most has already happened. Uh. Um, and I'm curious, like what that um, what what's the, the reason for that psychologically? And um, yeah, what like why 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 do we fear things that we've already uh mm survived because i that, i mean that i can certainly relate to and i i you know it's not uh it's very much not a linear process like coming to terms with all of these things because i i find myself like going through like uh, you know a million cycles a year of like you know i've done this before this is fine and then like oh my god i'm i'm gonna die you know um so what why why is that what is happening man? Let me jump in with this, and this is going to be uh, the idea uh, filtered through SAPE and not through Winnicott. Um, but there's a, a few basics here. One is that uh, psychoanalysis, which is, is not just the process of sitting there with a therapist and, and doing the work a certain way, but it's a way of, of looking at a human being, a way of looking at, at life and a feeling. In, in, in psychoanalysis, one of the basic assumptions is that um, everything we have experienced uh, in the past, this whole thing about, you know, tell me about your mother, you know, and uh, why the mother all the time? Well, because for the first couple of years of life, there is nothing you do that is not filtered through mommy. And why, what's this thing in psychoanalysis about mommy and the, and the breast? You know, mommy and 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 uh, her uh, the supposed sexuality of infants. Well, if you leave aside the question of, that that upsets some people about Freud, uh, that's about everything is about sex. It's really about how that first relationship becomes the in a way the programming, the, the first blueprint. code, mm -hmm. the blueprint, the code, the, the what you learn about how the universe works, how you work, um, what to expect. If I'm hungry, what happens? You know, if I do this with my hand, what happens? If I, ooh, I have a tooth, maybe I'll bite, what happens? And yeah, big deal. Well, when you're six months old, that's your whole world. And if mama yells at you, or if mama drops you, or if mama sticks a bottle in your mouth the second you cry, that's going to teach you about the world. And, and you ask, Joe, what is this about the catastrophe has already happened? One of the basics of psychoanalysis is that all of those early experiences begin to create this, this, this map, this sort of living, uh, shifting blueprint of how we expect the world to work. The other thing is that, and, you know, the, in the moment, uh, you know, the turning point, that, that moment when things happen, do I go left or do I go right? You know, what do I do when I'm scared or, I, or I, I'm turned on or I want something? Um, well, what do we have to draw on except a lifetime of experiences, a lifetime of expectations that have been hmm. built from uh, interactions with parents? I mean, look at it. I'm, uh, how many of us don't occasionally at least talk about, oh, you wouldn't believe the crap my mother or my father put me through or, you know, the trauma of my sibling and, and uh, you know, blaming the mother and, and all this. Come on, we all do this in one way or another. And so in a way, you could say that in the moment, I pick something in the last week that freaked you out, that terrified you, or that made you feel ashamed and incompetent. Well, it's very unlikely that that's the first time anything like that has ever happened to you. And you have a whole lifetime of echoes of those experiences that have conditioned yeah. you to believe what you believe. So if you're terrified in the moment, let's say, Joe, that you are going out on stage, that you decide to go start, are you doing shows these days? 
Um, no. <laughs> All right. So let's probably January or February of uh, 2020. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Nobody's doing shows, are they? Something happened, didn't it? <laughs> and we'll talk about that. Um, you have to go back on stage. And all of a sudden, you're flooded with these feelings. Uh, and it's like the first time you're going again. Except you know it's not the first time. You've done hundreds of shows. And all of those emotions having to do with humiliation, maybe. Or, you know, what if I freeze? Or what if they kill me? You know, or whatever the fantasy is. You've been through this before. And that fear is something you have already survived. And even if something new happens, the associations, those echoes you have inside you are going to be the ones that you can draw from, from experience. So if the, if the fact is that most of the time we go through something that shakes us up and makes us wonder if we can get through this next minute, much less this next hour, we've already survived those emotions countless times. We have already called upon whatever resources we pulled together from surviving our families and from surviving our peers and you know, all the the rites of passage a kid goes through. Um, so, this can, I, can is, I jump in with it? Please. Few, I mean, I, I agree to with with most of what you're saying, Dan. I just like a few maybe obvious points, but but one being that like the hippocampal structure in the brain. So so that the part of the brain that is responsible for for what we call episodic memory like the 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 time bound memory it doesn't start to develop i don't know if it's three or four years age or age or something Mm -hmm. so all of those first three years are bound with impressions that that what a person will always recognize you know if your if your pops played a certain tune every day for your first three years something will happen to you when you hear that tune but you have no way to place that because you don't have access so so the idea that psychoanalysis can retrieve certain of these that's that's false based on like neuroscience there is no way to recapture memories that would have happened even before you had a capacity to to remember stuff right so there could be a certain feeling of a catastrophe that happens to you that has some correlate within you but there is no way for you to to actually know so what you do in psychoanalysis is you try to formulate, let's say, alternative stories that match that feeling that you that could or could not be true, right? But they seem likely to be true. So you build a mosaic of perspectives on your parents and your siblings and your close environments that will speak to that feeling that you haven't been able to articulate, right? Like, why the fuck do I react when I hear Coltrane or whatever? I don't know. Maybe I will never know if my dad played the tune. But if I see that he was into jazz, uh, you know, he had a certain affinity for that type of music, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it feels likely that he might have played Coltrane, right? So you try to kind of suggest certain pieces to the puzzle uh, so that you would feel um, comfortable in, in kind of understanding your own version of your reality in a way. So I, I just wanted to add that. And that, so, so there is an inherent idea of something feels completely ununderstandable to you. You know, you run into something. But just like Dan said, there has probably been a schema, like a scheme of of patterns that that you have experienced before, but there is no way for you to consciously recollect that. So there is that eerie uncanniness that Freud talked a lot about, like an uncanny feeling, like I have experienced this before, but how the hell could I know? So that's the kind of main idea in Winnicott, I, I, I guess. I mean, I'm not a PhD in Winnicott, and I'm sure a lot of people would take contention with with what i said but that's my understanding of it that you carry this kind of unarticulable but unarticulable um kind of um, experience within us yeah. and it's through the hard work of being able to start to do, compose music write poetry do stand up you know we get closer to that proximity of like this actually makes sense this is my living story this is my my idea of how i became the way i became and maybe that's the courage of walking the plank to actually you know Bion was reading milton because he father his father recited that to him that's where we started this show right so there is some kind of um courage involved in like claiming your own history in a way like i'm the one to decide you know and and this is the way i look at it so i'm going to tell this joke to this audience and if they don't laugh fuck them you know (laughs) and i think that was yeah go joe uh yeah just your mic if um because i guess you're coming through your 
that through that mic. Uh, it when you move around, it's uh, kind of against your shirt. Ah, uh, cheers! Up. Did it did it mess up the whole thing I was trying no, to say? We just lost all our advertisers. <laughs> exactly. Maybe I should mute it when I'm not on. Also, that slurping sound of me drinking water is perhaps not the sexiest activity in the in the podcast world. I but, know, yeah. well, Martin, what is the sexiest activity? You can, oh, it's a <laughs> long show. Um, the, uh, you were referring in, in Winnicott, you referred to it as the incommunicado core. Yeah. That part of yourself that yeah. in, it, in itself, in your prob- and this is something we can come back to, you know, the, 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 whether it's, it's um, hard and fast that you're not going to recollect that old stuff. I think there's, there's, yeah. there are alternative channels, but, you know, yeah. that's not for the first show. Um, I'm not sure it's ever going to make much sense, but um, that incommunicado core, that, that those early experiences, which not only because of the, you know, the hippocampal development and the way we, we process memories and the ways in which, you know, the amygdala and the, you know, the, that, mm-hmm. uh, and the prefrontal medial cortex, all the stuff involved in trauma. Yeah, there's a machine in there that handles things a certain way or cannot handle things a certain mm-hmm. way. And when things are scary enough, uh, overload us enough, um, th- this is the nature of trauma. That yeah, dissociation. They, yeah. They, yeah, we dissociate and the memories get filed in a way someplace else and they're not in order. Uh, you could say the unconscious conscious mind for better and for worse doesn't keep track of the sequence of things it keeps track of the significance of things and the way they feel the impact they have on us which is one reason i mean there are neurological reasons but experientially this is one of the reasons why you smell a certain smell and bam that's your mama's gravy you know from when you lived in the first apartment you lived in you know Mm. uh, and you remember a color well that's the color of the rug that was in that place or you hear a, a moment of a song and you realize that oh well I was, it was the first time i made out with somebody you know in middle school or something and that song just brings the whole thing back to you you can't just go back there and file go through the files and say okay uh august 12th 1979 Ooh, i like that one it doesn't work like that you have to have something that 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 hits that that button and you said something else that was really important Martin, uh, which is about uh, what we have to do in order to make sense yes. of things, to have a life story. And the idea of the story, the narrative, how do we tell our story? Um, how do we make a, not just a sense of identity, like who am I, that I am somehow the, 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 the sum total of all of these things that have happened to me and then a whole bunch of you know, uh, mixing around with it and denial and defense and repression, all the stuff I can't look at and all the stuff I make up alternate explanations for, rationalizations, and then voila, you have the sense of who you are and then you have the story you tell yourself. And maybe, you know, if you ever get a chance to do something autobiographical, either write a book or just tell somebody your story at a party until their their eyes glaze over. Yeah, recite Um, Milton. Yeah, exactly. Or recite Milton at a party because, and in that moment, and this is the thing, and maybe we'll, we'll get a chance to do something with this here. Each of the things we're talking about, psychoanalysis, something we didn't mention, which is mindfulness, meditation, boxing, improvising music, especially in front of people, um, and uh, so many other things, I mean, sexual things, how we handle aggression, in the moment, there is that right now, that, that infinitesimal now, when we don't calculate everything we're going to do. Yeah. Most of the time, and we know this neurologically too, that in a way, we've made a, the decision about what we're going to do before we know we made a decision. Yeah, because that's you know the the, the speed of that unconscious processing uh, is well faster than our ability to deliberate and say what to do next. So in that moment, what we do is going to be determined by things that are coming from that incommunicado place, that that lifetime of 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 conditioning. You know, it's a behavioral word. Uh, people flinch and cringe at it, but we've been conditioned to react to life a certain way and so a real world example here um you read my book mm-hmm. you decided to send me an email yeah in a certain moment you had to decide do i reach out to this stranger yeah and then i get a message from a stranger mm-hmm. what am i going to do about that maybe i'm private maybe i don't feel up to doing this 
yeah. you know, maybe I'm tired of all the adulation and I'd like to be left alone yeah. by the screaming fans, you know, you throw your panties, but the rest of it, leave me alone. Um, or do you cringe? You become J.D. Salinger, you know, and you, you make yourself uh, essentially a hermit, just to protect mm -hmm. your anonymity because the moment is too much. Uh, every person who comes near you is an invader yeah. in a way. Um, and what else happens in a boxing ring? Uh, do I dare to throw this jab? You know, who yeah. is it? Uh, do I, who's the poet? Do I dare to eat a peach? You know, uh, imagine somebody who is so anxious or obsessive compulsive that every action seems to have uh, unbearable consequences. Well, in that boxing ring, if I, if I twitch my shoulder a little bit, I'm going to jab. Am I going to get hit in the face? Um, am I going to get humiliated? Am I yeah. going to make the wrong choice and step into traffic? In jazz, you're playing in front of an audience or you're a comedian and you're about to put a new spin on a joke you haven't tested yet. But, yeah, but let's go there. I, 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 I stuck a little bit what you said about me writing you this book and uh, this text about your book and you replying. And I think that's a good uh, piece because, one, it's not very... I mean, it has happened before that I've reached out to people, but it's definitely not often that I write... And and to be fair, I mean, your book is a is a great book, but it's not like on the block. You know, it's not like uh, it, it. I guess you've gotten a few of these emails, but it's probably not a thousands of them, right? Like it's a niche. It's a niche book you've written in in the global view of things, right? So so I decided, yeah, I'm going to write it because I really appreciated this book. I mean, it, it found me in the same kind of place as that Eigen quote. It's like. This guy is doing something that reminds me of something incommunicado within myself. You know, the way you put things together, the way you weave stuff. Like there is a resemblance that I that I don't know so much about within myself. And I wrote and you answered. So here we are. And that kind of click, right? I think there's something important there. Like when when Beyond maybe recited those poems, maybe he was able to find his... Um, incommunicado and making it communicable right like who knows all the reasons for why he would choose to do that but maybe that was a way where he just found like i'm doing who i am right now and that that gets felt somehow right there is a certain genuinity about that so you have on the one side all those erroneous programming behaviors that we do that just lead to the same results but then you have those odd times when you step in a little bit of a different direction. You write an email, the guy answers, and we make a show together with Joe out of this. And what is that? Like, I want to talk about that click, like that affinity, like that kind of, you know, uh, what, how, how do we conceptualize or make sense of that when things just... And I guess my hypothesis here is that that's when the incommunicado actually has become communicable. Like all the work that has gone through a person like beyond being able to do that, you know, the bravery involved, the choice of poetry, whatever. Like there is something about everything that has led him up to there that makes that moment so special for a guy like Mike Egan. Or is it a, is it a divine process? Like what, how do we understand those moments when you decide to hit the jab or the, the, the cross and it sticks to the guy's nose, and you're like, man, I sucker punched that dude. He fucking fell. Like, how did I do this? You know, like, what are, what are your guys' take on that? What is it that happens, if you understand at all what I'm trying to... No clue. I'm sorry. Yeah. No. <laughs> Joe, do you have anything? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean uh, not really. Uh, I... I can relate to this this sort of thinking um if nothing else i uh have done a lot of thinking back to like how much had to happen just for me to be alive mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and uh you know for for you and i to be a part of the same family like we're not blood related you know so um yeah i i, uh, I definitely see where you're going with that yeah you know i i think you use the word affinity a couple of times, Martin, mm. and there's another affinity between us. I, I, I love the word and I love the concept. I, I'd been working on a project with another friend a couple of years ago uh, about 
the the feeling of the word affinity and the, the meaning the idea that, that 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 things meet even in you know some of the work that I the things that I wrote that that you had responded to the idea that that a boundary the point where things meet yes. it's not just it's not just a separation you know a boundary doesn't just separate it's also a, a, like a, it's a point of, of transformation uh, it's a just think about the, 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 the head, the skin, the head of a drum. You know, you touch it and you get this sound or the, the point of contact where something happens. And to me, you know, I know this is a thing for, for Eigen also, uh, the idea that when two personalities meet, an emotional storm happens. Uh, and the moment, that, that, that moment when, uh, when something happens and life changes, or a new idea emerges, or a new feeling, a new possibility emerges. Yeah, you could say this is a bunch of you know my mystical crap, but you know to me it's anything but. If you pay attention to what happens in the moment, to a moment of realization, I mean, even in you know people who love uh, playing around with pop quantum physics and science fiction, uh, the idea that that every time you make the, an infinitesimal choice, there is a whole new universe. That is born the many worlds hypothesis. I know that it's, it's that's controversial in ways, but there's a piece of this that is absolutely, if, if not true, it's captivating. We have movies about it. Sliding doors. Gwyneth Paltrow gets yeah, on the train, doesn't I've get on that. the train. Yeah. Two different lives. Yeah. At the moment of contact, what yeah. happens? So um, it's like the sails get in the wind. You know, that's the yeah. image I get in my head. You're absolutely. in a storm, and then all of a sudden the sea calms down, and you can raise the sails. And it's like everything yeah. starts gliding and i think really these conversations with you dan has been a place for me to be able to just say what i think just like this with the sail right now it's like a weird fucking image like where did that come from and why should i say that in a different setting i would hesitate but here i'm confident enough you know given all our prior talks that throwing in that association will build the conversation so i feel included with just going with the gut like that's the image that popped in my head I throw it out there, and I, I, I think that you will just vibe off of that, you know? So there is something of that, of like, of saying the thing that one of you guys said before, like, saying the thing. Like, I guess it would be the same in a stand-up. You get a hunch, and maybe you hesitate, and sometimes maybe you go with it, right? Like, should I pick that up from the audience, or should I, you know, in improv and jazz? Like, should I play off of that tune? Fuck it, I'll go. And it's timing. It, is, it yeah. has to be, it has to be in the now. You can't come oh. back. <laughs> and play an idea right exactly yeah. yeah remember what you said before the i was thinking about sales and like oh never mind like <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah exactly that's why i interrupt him so often yeah <laughs> which <I> is <laughs> and one of the reasons one of the reasons i defer is because uh, if you jumped in you have something to say and i don't want to miss an opportunity i don't want to miss a possibility mm -hmm. of experiencing something new uh, in, in a way, you know, you could say e each moment of this, like when, when I, I had to make a very difficult decision in and around 2003, when I had this vague idea about music and improvisation and that there was something wrong with the all of the basic theories of my profession and that I could use music to try to articulate that. But that talk about facing fear of consequences wow. if I reach out if I dare you know to, to wiggle my finger what's going to happen if I much less to put out an idea that might offend the people who are going to give me you know the okay to go become a doctor um, but I had to face the fear of do I write this everybody was telling me not to bad idea mm. um, but yeah. I had nothing else I had nothing else I had to offer and as I'm writing it, it began to feel like um, a, a calling, an e a, a vocation. That's what the word means, but it's more than just a trade. Um, it was a calling that I had to say this. And it, I used to imagine that um, writing this was like writing a message in a bottle and that that bottle would land on somebody's beach. Somebody would read it and yeah. react to it, and I wouldn't be alone. I wouldn't be the only person having these thoughts because at the time, if anybody had published anything similar to what I was writing, I couldn't find it. And uh, you know, I, I'd like to think I oh, wasn't that cool. I came up with an innovative idea, but it was terrifying because I had to stake my future. Literally, I had to stake my my academic professional future. I don't know how to make a, a dollar doing anything else. 
uh, other than what I'm doing now. Yeah, I could be a fighter. I could make money being a guy who gets beat up. You know, that, that would have been my opportunity. Um, and so in that moment, I had to make that choice. And you send me an email. I have to make a choice. Do I let a person in? Uh, today, I had to make a choice. I'm sparring against a, a, a 22 year old athlete who, you know, is twice as fast as I am. And I'm about to throw a right uppercut because I see the opening. I don't want to get humiliated. I don't want to get knocked on my butt and show the, everybody in the gym that I can't fight. But I let the uppercut go. The next thing I know, my, my, my opponent, my partner, in, my sparring partner is bleeding. Now, I'm sorry if anybody is, 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 is swooning and fainting right now, but in that moment, that was this tiny little affirmation. I felt bad for the guy, but then again, we all get nosebleeds. Um, I realized I had been in that sparring session terrified of the consequences of anything I might do. But then I just did what a person does in a ring. I threw the punch, and I learned that it works. And, you know, he had to deal with it his own way. Um, and at every moment in a, in, a, in a psychoanalytic session, whether you're the patient, I have a wonderful analyst now I just uh, who has helped me, as he says, trust the process. If it emerges, say it. Trust it. Let it happen. Um, in friendships, in relationships, in my work, if somebody wants to say something, I want to hear it. Mm -hmm. I want to live a life now of openness to what other people can offer, not just because I find it interesting, but because every time you allow something to happen that has a possibility attached to it, mm -hmm. there is a new piece of life that can emerge from that, a tiny yeah. piece or a big piece. And that and, I think is Eros, man. I think that's when you did that sign before yeah. of merge, like when things come Eros combine. is affinity. Yeah, exactly. And that, that's what can happen. You give space for Eros to happen if you start saying what you want, what you're actually thinking and listen, you know, like you said, you put it more eloquently than I can, but like allowing things to be said, right? That's also a certain presence of, of actually listening and, and being able to allow another person to speak their mind. So there is something about play, eros, and saying the thing, enlighten the spark and articulating your subject. I mean, we, we, we are jamming with the idea of calling the show, figuring it out as we go, right? Figuring out, figure it out along as we go. So I think, you know, towards that end, like this is my reading of what we have figured out in a way. I don't know if how well I can put it, but there is something there of, of that combination of things of like the light and spark, walking the plank, uh, being courageous, saying the thing, that creates a certain spark for other people to do that. And, you know, in a combined or communal setting, that allows things like play, spontaneity, uh, genuinity, um, what we would call more as eros in, in psychoanalytical language, whereas thanatos would be more closed off, protective. Yeah, um, life and death know, instincts. Paranoid, kind of everybody's suspicions. So... I don't know, Joe, what do you think we have figured out? Like, what, 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 how do we make sense of, of what we have been jamming around with here? Yeah, I, I was thinking about, um, uh, as you're talking about all this, the, the you know, uh, infinite possibilities thing. That's, that's sort of what my brain's stuck on here. Mm -hmm. And I have two Good. things that, that are basically the two things I add to everything. <laughs> uh, which is, one is about Republicans and one is about Star Trek. So um, the, the, it strikes Go me on. that, um, uh, you know, you said, Dan, like uh, you, it, this was a passing thought in what you said, but you said like, n not only is it more interesting to like allow for all these possibilities or to like let the thing happen or like say the thing. Um, and it, it strikes me that, uh, you know, Republicans, conservatives are uh, in many ways, they, they limit those possibilities. Uh, at least, you know, at least like the, the, the current form of like, you know, the U.S. Republican Party. Um, that's what I see a lot of with them. And uh, especially when it comes to kind of the social side of things where they they're upset about 
transgender language and they're upset about uh, gay people and and like anything that like that we're like, oh, there's a new word for this now or like, mm -hmm. you know, there's a new concept in, in gender, whatever it is. Um, it's just a, an immediate like, no, what are you talking about? This is stupid. And like, um, you know, uh, PC and cancel culture, whatever it is. And it, it, like I, you know, I was never like uh, I never had a problem with gay people or trans people or anything like that. But I there was a time where like the the political correctness thing, I was a little more on like that side of it where I was like, oh, stop telling people what to say. Stop telling people what not to say. Um, and I really did feel that when I started to uh, uh, learn about it and and got out of that way of thinking, I was like, oh, life is way more interesting now <laughs> because there is so much more you can learn from people if when, when someone says hey um this bothers me or like there's actually a different way to say this now um there is like a whole world of knowledge that they are uh presenting to you if you will take it you know yeah. um i remember listening to uh there's a podcast by two comedians, um, Hari Kondabolu and W. Kamau Bell. And they're both very um, political in, in their stand-up and everything. And, and they met working on, on a show that starred Kamau and, and Hari was a writer um, that was all about politics. And I remember listening to their, their political podcast and... Uh, there was something where they they made some joke one week where they said, "Oh, this thing is my my spirit animal," or something like that. And that's a you know it's a common like parlance, or it was a few years ago at least. People would say like, "Oh, uh, like this this person is awesome. They're my spirit animal," or whatever. Um, and then one week they they read a letter from a listener that said, "Hey, so I'm actually an indigenous person and." Um, it's it's actually not really cool to make this joke about spirit animals, and I I was sort of on the line here. I was starting to like not be the like anti PC guy anymore. I wasn't all the way back over the line yet, and I almost had the thought. I almost was like, oh come on, spirit animal, like you're gonna get upset about this. Like come on, um, there's so many important things they talk about on this show. And we're gonna do this. Um, but I stopped myself. This was like one of the, the, the growing moments for me on that journey. Um, and I was like, okay, just listen, like hear what, what the letter says. And, uh, they, you know, it, it's, I don't remember exactly what they said, but it's not important. Basically it was like, there's this whole history of like what a spirit animal actually means and like what, um, how, uh, whatever indigenous groups like uh, interact with that concept and everything. And I was like, wow, if I had just gone with the initial thought and turned off the podcast because I thought it, it didn't like immediately resonate with me, um, I wouldn't have gotten to hear all of that. <laughs> and there's just like a cool kind of history lesson there. And, 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 now I know a new way to not hurt people. <laughs> so, yeah. and that's that is uh, first of all, I'm, thank you for bringing in politics because there's 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 plenty of political stuff that Martin and I have have been bouncing off of here because the you know um, politics you know deal, dealing with the 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 dynamics of 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 the public and and of cultures crashing into each other you know, the emotional storms that come from different ideas and backgrounds um yeah it's easy to smirk you know you can have that the, the easiest cheapest reaction is oh come on you're gonna accuse someone of cultural appropriation for saying the phrase spirit animal my initial reaction was look i'm in some respects a jungian i like archetypes i like the idea that there is a there is a basement full of human stuff that everybody shares that basement 
and everything in it. And that if you or I or Matt Gates were to go down and do an ayahuasca ceremony, you're going to find your spirit animal. You know what? You, uh, some Ukrainian Jew, is going to go, I'm going to, I don't know what Ukrainian sp tundra spirit animals, you know, like the Siberian, you know, wombat or whatever it is. But the idea is that that, the, my initial reaction is we're all going to encounter some primitive part of ourself and the way a human being relates to that. Now, I'm not going to say anything about the actual spirituality about it today because oh, I, I don't know what I'd be talking about. But um, in line with what you just said, is it, wait a second, that would be the cheap and fast response. Mock it. Just mock the objection. But then again, let's say the guy who's bringing up this so-called politically correct objection, this polite uh, mention of cultural appropriation, um, let's say he's had a life, just hypothetically. <laughs> he's had some experiences. They're personal experiences. Their experiences of his culture, their experiences of his culture filtered through his family. They mean something to him. Maybe he's being oversensitive, maybe he's not. Right. But if you shut him down, which, and I'm sorry, but, you know, may I'm not sorry, the um, Thanatos, the death instinct and conservative Republican thought, I'm sorry, they are, they, they are one and the same. The idea that anything new, that anything that can be mocked and shut down, anything that would make you dare to think a new thought is dangerous. Well, I'd like to hear what that guy had to say. Because if I can get through my own scorn, then maybe I'll find out a different way of looking at the world, even in some tiny way, and maybe I'll be a better person for it. Yeah, That's I think. I think that this just made me think of of that Trump's only kind of skill in political life seemed to be to make mocking names out of people, right? Yep. So it's a funny, it's a funny point that just that was his perfection of right. like killing people through evil jokes and and stuff. But anyhow. What I what I take from your story, Joe, it's a it's a good story, I think, and you tell it with candor, like it's uh, like Dan said. Thanks for sharing it, and I think, regardless of let's say the political uh, connotations of all this, from a like psychoanalytical setting, I think what you talk about is very important. Like in small situations, to be able to choose, let's say, love or good in a way, is actually important. Like a whole life of those small settings. It makes the world bigger, you know, for you in this case, like for the individual, but also for others. And there is some, I mean, it's difficult here without falling to like cliches and like preacher, you know, missionary language. But there is something sacred in, in those kind of acts. And I think the realization of the of that it actually matters for an individual, I think, is a way, a, a sign of maturity. And, and, I, and I, I kind of stand by that, that, that these things... Because the opposite is also true. A whole life of mocking people, a whole life of bullying people, a whole life of shutting down everything that you're too scared to, so that you won't shine, so that you won't be the, the star that everybody looks at. That also has consequences. Now you'll find yourself in a bench with a bottle. I mean, like there, there, is, there is some kind of geometry in all this that I think plays out. And, and to bring it back to faith, um, to kind of round off, at least from my from my uh, input to this discussion, we've been through over an hour now, and I think like this faith. I mean, there's another beautiful synchronicity that there's a guy called Dave Liebman, who is also one of Dan's friends, who wrote. Uh, the I think great a preface. Liebman. Yeah, he has made a track together with with a guy. Maybe we can find it and make it a part of this episode or, or an outro. But uh, it's called uh, "Love Is a Prayer." And I think it resonates quite well with the theme of faith, once again, in a, in a not a like religious dogmatic sense, but in a broader whatever the fuck we've been trying to talk about. But that love is a prayer. And I think that little anecdote you shared is exactly that. You know, it's like small sparks, small bonfires of doing something nice. It doesn't cost much, but it actually matters uh, for people. Uh, yeah. And, and it I takes think, courage. Yeah. It takes courage to listen. It takes courage to open. And mm -hmm. the, maybe one of the political dimensions that we will come back to again and again, and, you know, and people say, oh, he's talking about Trump. I'm not listening to this show. Um, but, yeah, we have a culture now, a gigantic uh, 
to me malignant, malicious trend, which is very human. It's come up in every culture, in every country that feels itself under threat in some way, which is this idea that there is something moral and necessary and courageous in shutting everybody down and dividing you know, this narcissism of small differences, which is another Freudian idea. The idea that, that the, the thing that resembles you but is just a little bit too different becomes your enemy. That, in fact, the courage and the compassion and the capacity to grow and the irony that, that so many of the supposed, the idea of the religious right, that somehow religion, which should at least double down on its own ideas of compassion and openness and empathy, in fact, has become uh, associated with this need to single out the other, to single out the enemy and shut him down, and then attribute the decision to God. <laughs> the Lord knows somehow God hates everything I hate. Right. Yeah, that's I mean, isn't that a coincidence? <laughs> It's convenient, right? So, I, I, so there's something about compassion in what we're talking about here, because uh -huh. it takes courage and compassion to shut up and listen. And maybe you have a new thought and make a new friend and become a better person. Is that such a radical idea? Right. Uh, yeah, I, and I think, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Joe, to kind of, you can wrap it. I think it just wanted to sneak, sneak in here that I think this theme we made it the first episode, like if I can be, if you can be you, then maybe I can be me. Also, because I think we have an idea that this theme, whatever this theme is, of a certain hope and a certain love is a prayer uh, attitude will hopefully be a kind of main current in this episode, even though we'll, you know, have in this show, even though we'll have different episodes, I think this will be a kind of arc that will carry uh, a lot of it. So I just wanted to sneak in that. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So, well, the first, the other thing I wanted to, uh, to mention was Star Trek because, uh, something yeah. happened in like January or February of this year where, um, I, uh, got an urge to watch a specific old episode of TNG, the next Which one. one. And, um, uh, um, the inner light. I was about to ask you, was it the inner light ah. where in a moment he has this whole life? Yeah. And the little music that like, please go on. Right, yeah. <laughs> I'm all excited now. Yeah, it's wild. I mean, it's a great episode. And then that made me want to rewatch the rest of the series. And then something else, you know, clicked in my head. And I was like, let's watch every episode of every Star Trek that's ever aired. <laughs> and it's a reasonable so, which is, Yeah, which is a project I very recently finished. Um, and, uh, but yeah, so the this idea of of the the many possibilities the many worlds or you know multiverse theory um that's something that star trek deals with both uh head on and also at times like it's implicit i mean like you know you might uh i've i've heard about it through like fan theories and stuff um in other ways that it might apply um because you know there, there's a lot of like time travel plots where they, you know, uh, something happens that changes the past and then something's different in the future. And um, there are entire, like the, you know, the newer film franchise, uh, the J.J. Abrams movies are take place entirely in a separate, uh, you know, universe path that uh, so, something changes early on. And then it's like, you have the same cast from the original show, but like it's a different world. Like things just go a little bit differently. Um, and at the same time, you know, you're dealing with with almost 60 years of TV shows with different writing staffs and, and different creative teams and stuff. So in many ways, they're they're all in the same like, you know, uh, literary universe. But um the i you know i've read fan theories that that say like you know it's possible because like they deal with time travel and and alternate universes and stuff so often that a lot of times we're we're just seeing things happening in a different universe like it, it could be that like uh voyager and deep space nine like aren't even like in the same dimension you know um 
and there there's a, a little enough um overlap between the shows that that's actually possible um and you know the the whole concept of the franchise in itself is here's a possible future of earth and humanity um and it's mostly a, a good future i think um it's a society that's gotten past a lot of these divisions we were just talking about and um the uh a, a lot of the sort of xenophobia that comes with religion and ideologies and um, the, uh, you know, they they don't have really like poverty. They, they just sort of take care of people. And, and um, it's, uh, I, I have less of an idea of where this, this one was going, but it, <laughs> but what you were saying reminded me. Don't of, worry about it. I think the, I think the inner light, was just the, the 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 name of it vibes very well with all this so like just that episode of like an inner light it's a beautiful a beautiful image of a person being lit up or i mean that's what i see right you know what like, you have? there's this uh i i was very touched by that and yeah the 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 title of the episode is also in, in itself beautiful the the episode and you know you can f correct me uh but um, as usual, you know, the, the ship encounters an anomaly, and the next thing you know, the captain is struck unconscious on the bridge, and the next thing you know, he is living a life. He is, he has a family, he has a job, uh, in this culture, which apparently is, you know, is facing some serious challenges, and in the episode, he goes through the, a chunk of a lifetime. The, the second half, he has a, a wife and children, and it's revealed, you know, when he finally comes to uh, on the bridge, two seconds have gone by, and that what this was, was a little pack of, uh, you know, very potent software from a dead race that they sent out the message in a bottle, in a way into outer space in the hopes that it would encounter somebody who would then inherit the memories of these people who are now gone from the world. And their universe is dead. They don't exist anymore. But now, by uh, you know, uploading themselves uh, forcefully into Jean-Luc Picard, you not only have a memorable episode, I mean, I, I get teary-eyed thinking about this sometimes, um, but if you want to join that that literary universe, I forget the name of the race. Now those people will never be forgotten. Their culture now lives on in, of course, the lead character of the show. Um, and and there's a, the the uh, the sort of lessons that they try to impart to him as well are very important because the uh, <laughs> the issue that that they're dealing with when he goes back and lives this life is. Uh, very much a, a a um parallel to climate change in real life um so there's that and there's like weird run-ins he has with the government um but, and and they're like you know not doing enough and it, it's 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 a very thin metaphor but um, it's uh that those those messages as well it's like again like here's you know here's this terrible fate that has befallen our civilization. We can now send this, this probe out that will teach someone else, like, don't let this happen. <laughs> and yeah. then you'll find yourself in a better universe. Mm -hmm. So it's so not just, here's our story. It's here's what we can offer you. Yeah. And I mean, this is so cool. I haven't seen this episode and I'm not a huge, uh, you know, I don't know Star Trek. Maybe this is a great impetus for me to start digging to into it. But I think it's funny because this whole way of paying it forward, you know, that that ancient culture can live on the way you explain it. I think it's also very similar, like, you know, beyond his past, Mike Egan is in his late 80s. You know, we're throwing this little digital bottle out there now. We're trying to send out some of these ideas that we have, you know, ran through and, and whatever we can make of them, you know, how they have impacted us. So there is that little analogy of sending this little Zoom show out and see if it reaches somebody you know if there is some hope of 
of this stuff being able to help forge together more kind of eras, not only horizontally between different groups, but also vertically, you know, across generations, across time, so that these ideas can be updated and adapted to new contexts. So there is a certain uh, holding together of what works or what, what we think works. Yeah, affinity. Yeah, that's faith. That's faith. There you go, man. Let's let's wrap it at that. that let's it faith. holds yeah. together, that we hold yeah. together, and it takes a little work and a little openness, not yeah. to shut things down, but to let them unfold and connect yeah. and carry forward. And, well, you want to end it there? I think so. I think we've done like an hour and 15 minutes. I need to start to get going. I think it's a lot of... Maybe maybe if we stay on, what I'd like to do then is to kind of more tease out. I mean, I do take this position off, and it's something I often do. I try to synthesize. Like I said in the beginning, you know, my rational mind will play tricks on me of always trying to structure everything. But what do you guys think are, what have we discovered, Dan, today? Like, if we figure it out as we go, like, how do we kind of wrap this into towards an ending of this show? Like what have been the key points for you or the takeaways or whatever to use? For me, uh, mm. well, one is that what we're doing is possible. And actually, I don't know, maybe not bad. Uh, I think we push record and talk and have faith that our uh, minds and our judgment will lead us to say things that are worth saying and maybe worth listening to. Um, I think that this is, first of all, um, a living example of what we're trying to say, you know, say it, push record and yeah, speak and do it yeah. and, and have faith that, that this will open something up and that, that, you know, it can only benefit us, even a bad show. Um, and maybe somebody out there, as Joe, you, you said, as, as you were talking about the, the way the culture now uh, is open to, to this, in a way has been created by the ability of individuals to, uh, like in the old days, hey, kids, let's put on a show. Right. Well, guess what? <laughs> Anybody can do it. You know, it's another thing to make people want to tune in and, and, and watch again. But this is proof of concept for me. But there there is also uh, the, the other message that we're getting through here that maybe if we're carrying forward uh, yeah. the message of a Michael Eigen and a Wilfred Bion, and Bion was carrying forward lessons he learned as a combat commander in the British Army, yeah. and going back to philosophers, uh, you know, from the mathematician Poincaré, and going back to Schopenhauer, and going, th these were all people who dedicated their lives, one way or another, to putting out an insight that might transform the way you look at the world, and the way you can move and make things happen in the world, and perhaps in an ethical, moral, spiritual way, enlighten other people and help them to enlighten others too it's maybe a, a you know I, i'm getting old and, and 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 soft in the head but i think without this you got nothing you have people you know avoiding their neighbors and keeping their mouths shut for fear of consequences mm -hmm. and then that's why people die spiritually and maybe that's why cultures die because they don't try to manifest themselves yeah yeah, and I, I think that, um, how, you know, like Martin, you brought the faith book today. Like, I think having something like that as a jumping off point, and you did a good job, like, tying it back in at the end. I really feel like we did sort of come full circle, you know. Mm -hmm. um, cool. But, uh, yeah, I think that I think that works. Yeah. So, yeah, do it again, huh? Yeah. Uh, let, let, me try affinities. yeah. let me try rapping. So maybe we even name it Affinities. But yeah. for now, this is Martin Hallberg, Joseph Messina, and I'm Dan Sapin, and we're figuring it out as we go along.